A long time ago, we humans were a bunch of dumb cave people driven by an eternal desire for food, sex and violence. Someday in the far future, we'll be involved into folk of true enlightened intellect, emotionless masters of logic like Mr. Spock. Sadly right now, we're still uncomfortably in the middle. Somehow society already expects us to be at this high level of brain evolution where we're all brain computers of pure logic. Alas, there's still a huge chunk of lizard brain stuck in our heads, no matter how desperately we're trying to hide it into a corner. There are fascinating consequences from this in our culture. Take movie criticism for example, internet's bread and butter. All of your favorite movie critics on the internet will often tell you that movies have to be smart, make you feel clever, characters need to act intelligent, and everything needs to make sense. Alrighty. So, what movies do they gravitate toward? Big, dumb spectacle movies filled with giant monsters causing giant or explosions. Huh. You'd think that if they're so thirsty for intelligent entertainment, they'd look for some French art movies or slow prodding character studies rather than Batman vs. Godzilla. They might act like they're all Mr. Spock, being all sophisticated and smart, but in the end, our inner Vulcan is merely chilling in the backseat of our brain and it's very much our inner cave people behind the wheel. And they want to watch giant monkeys stomping on robots, damn it! And hey, don't take this as me trying to be all high and mighty above these other critics, I'm right there with them. Movies lure us in on a caveman level, oh look at all those sexy Hollywood actors and their sexier explosions, and then they try their damage to make us leave the movie in awe of some deep meaningful ending. But what makes this phenomenon more fascinating to me is when the cave person energy and the Vulcan energy are in conflict with each other. That the intellectual point the movie is making goes completely against the very temptation it was luring us in with. So let's talk about what TV tropes called do not do this cool thing and what I like to call boomerang movies. Here's an example. Jurassic Park! Boy, when I went to that movie with my friends as kids, we had dinosaur t-shirt, we had our dinosaur action figures, memorized all the dinosaur trivia, lecturing our mom on the difference between a brontosaurus and a brachiosaurus, got our dinosaur themed popcorn, got our dinosaur themed soda, the movie starts. Ooh, dinosaurs really exist, look at them, wow! Wow, dinosaur theme park, look how cool it is! Wow, dinosaurs, yay! And then the intellectual part of the movie starts, and Jeff Goldblum comes on screen, and he's all, Uh, a dinosaur's bad guy? Yeah, whatever, Jeff Goldblum, get lost. So then the movie continues, and there's adventure, and excitement, and thrills, and in the end, the heroes are all like, I learned my lesson, let's never make a dinosaur theme park ever again. Hooray! Wait, what? Hey, movie, what are you doing? Dinosaurs are awesome, what the hell are you talking about? What is this? <laughs> I remember later when the semi-reboot was announced, Jurassic World, all the movie critics I watched had the same two statements about the new trailer. Number one, wow, the Jurassic Park is actually open now. I always wanted to see how the park would actually have looked like if it was active, this is great. And two, hey, why did they resurrect the dinosaurs and make another zoo again? Didn't they watch the first movie? The first movie taught us, Oh, dinosaurs are bad, McKay? This sucks! So right out of the gate, before the new movie has done a single thing, the audience is already punching itself in the face. Being, Yay, a movie about a dinosaur park! And, How dare this movie about a dinosaur park have a dinosaur park in it! At the same time, it's wonderful! So, my inner caveman isn't pleased. Even my inner Mr. Spock isn't all that impressed, to be honest. Wait, why aren't dinosaurs bad? In the second movie, one of the main characters captures animals for a zoo. And then starts lecturing the villains because they're capturing dinosaurs, huh. Okay, so what's the difference between putting a T-Rex in a cage instead of a tiger? That they're dangerous? Hippos are dangerous and I see those bashes in zoos all the time. The only argument the movie makes is don't have shitty security. So, okay, fine, I agree. Improve security, but don't blame it on the dinos. Because all the bad things happening in the movie is because the park is awkwardly designed and the security sucks. Replace all the dinos with hippos and lions and tigers and you basically get the same problem, right? So you screw up the security means that all dinosaurs are bad and we should never attempt a new park? Yeah, great. Thanks, Jeff Goldblum. First you fuck up teleportation in the fly and now you're ruining dinosaurs. Just because you suck at science doesn't mean we all have to give up, you son of a... Uh, Jeff Goldblum is just playing a character called Malcolm. Yeah, yeah shut up, Mr. Spock. Man, imagine if Jeff Goldblum was in charge of... Inventing airplanes, you just look at the first test flight and just go, ah, eh, flying is bad, McKay, and we cancel all our air flight development. Of course, the big line of wisdom that we're all supposed to be impressed by is, uh, well, just because you could doesn't mean you should. Oh, wow, an argument, it rhymes. Oh, wow, an argument, it rhymes. What a super smart argument if it rhymes. What the hell does that mean? So your argument is maybe don't? Well, here's my counter argument. Maybe do. There, checkmate, Jeff Goldblum. Ha, ah, I have a point besides that, uh, maybe don't do it. 
Oh, sorry, it's an ethical argument. Creating life is bad. Don't play for God. Respect Mother Nature, right. You're concerned about upsetting Mother Nature? You came flying in with a helicopter. That already seems like a big middle finger to Mother Nature to me. Mother Nature's all like, oh, humans can't swim in the water. Yeah? Well, here's a submarine, lady. Suck it. Humans can't fly in outer space? So, Chuck, here's a flag stabbing your stupid little moon. Up yours, Mother Nature. Go pester someone else with your stupid little rules. Nobody cares. <laughs> I mean, Jeff Goblin, you're a mathematician. Th th that's what you do in math, right? Stick to, to chaos, the impredictability, the, the energy of nature. And stomp it into submission until it's just a bunch of numbers and formulas you can predict and calculate. We, we have computers and, and, and cities, and, and now you're concerned about playing for God and upsetting Mother Nature? Pandora's box already been opened, baby. Ha 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 ha. Too late. Of course, these are all problems of the movie. The book was a little more smart about it, or at least more focused. That they make the dinosaurs themselves and scientists underestimating their abilities to cause what, why everything went wrong. So, okay, fine. Ethics, us overstepping our boundaries, the folly of men. They're all valid points to be made, themes to be explored. Except Jurassic Park, the movie, doesn't. Because we have chases and murder to get to. Ah, big monster with big teeth, run! Because in the end, Jurassic Park's a caveman movie. It works on caveman energy. Awesome dinosaurs, big exciting action. So the movie's entire ethical debate really boils down to it's unethical to create dinosaurs because ah big teeth run. Want a smart Jurassic Park? Read the book. Except the book is boring, so who gives a fuck? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dinosaurs are bad. Blah 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 blah. Shut up, book. I want dinosaurs. Do you have any? Da -da 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 -da. No, you don't. So shut up, stupid book. So look, my point isn't that Jurassic Park's a bad movie or that the intellectual point it's bringing up is bad by itself. I just find it fascinating that its moral and core point have little to do with the action on screen. Because the action structure of the movie was never really designed to be about its ethical arguments. It's about being a thrilling adventure movie. So now we get a movie about how awesome dinosaurs are, and then it slaps you across the face for liking dinosaurs. Tch. I mean, it's, it's even grabbing the conclusion of the book that came to that conclusion after, like, hours of exploring the themes of what it's about and just pacing it on a random action movie. Never mind dinos. You know what my favorite movie genre is? Treasure hunting movies. It's great. It's all action hero man and the exciting treasure of excitingness. There's a shiny treasure and it's all money and magic and it will make you indestructible and create rainbows and puppies. So let's go and travel the world and go on adventure, sacrifice time and energy and kill innocent wildlife and murder endless mooks. All this excitement, all these epic journeys, all these challenges. And then our heroes are finally in the big treasure room and then... Uh, uh treasure is a bad McKay? And boom, everyone goes home empty-handed. It's the ultimate middle finger genre of movies. I think of all the treasure hunt movies I've ever seen, I remember only one where the hero actually get to keep the treasure, and that's National Treasure. Huh. I guess even anti-treasure morals don't mess with Nicolas Cage. Anyway, if the hero's lucky, they merely find an empty box with The real treasure was within you all along. Message inside of it? Ah, great, I'm sure my landlord will be happy to hear that when he asks me for the rent. But if the hero is unlucky, the treasure will murder everyone involved with magic space lasers. See, this is because being greedy is the greatest sin you can commit in a Hollywood movie. You're a murderer? No problem. I mean, what self-respecting action hero doesn't murder a couple million people? Mistreating women with sexual harassment? <laughs> we do that all the time in Hollywood to all our actors as child stars in Hollywood. No problem. But a movie character expressing an interest in wealth? Oh, oh, oh boy. Now you overstepped your boundaries, sir. It's kind of the flip coin to the it's two days until retirement deadline. You know, in a, in a war movie, that, that when a character suddenly starts talking about their lovely wife and children back home and the, the fun stuff they'll do when his retirement finally starts next week, you immediately know they will die soon. At least with those characters, their death is supposed to be sympathetic. But I Enjoy Money is like the evil twin of that line. It's also an instant death sentence, but without the sympathy. Because there's an important moral Hollywood desperately wants to teach his audience. Do not have an interest in wealth. Being wealthy is dangerous. Leave it to the professionals. Professionals such as our friends in Hollywood. They'll take care of the being wealthy part of our society on your behalf. No worries. And that's why I love Indiana Jones. It's like Spielberg and Lucas created the ultimate awesome action hero. And then they'll immediately embarrass about him and have this, this weird hatred for him. And they don't know what to do with this character. I mean, sure, he's all awesome and cool and strong and smart and all that. But uh, he has an interest in treasure. Oh, icky. <laughs> so what do we do with this character? Huh? 
especially from the third movie on, it becomes really hilarious. Like, I love in The Last Crusade that Indy suddenly gets his, uh, it belongs in a museum catchphrase. Every single time he has to deal with some treasure, he yells it, ah, oh, it belongs in a museum. It's almost like he's pleading with the audience. Like, like I'm in the audience and I'm all like, hey, Indy, I'm watching this Indiana Jones and the Awesome Treasure of Excitement movie, and if you suddenly dare to express interest in pursuing this treasure, how dare you, sir? I'm offended. And Indy's all pleading, no, sir, I swear I'm not interested in actual treasure. I'm putting it in a museum. It's really about preserving wisdom and, and history and all that. I, I would never actually be interested in money. Please forgive me. Ah, uh, like, oh, our noble hero. Preserving history and presenting the culture of the world in our museums. Musea, whatever the multiplier word is. So then we go watch Indy smashing up a library floor. And, oh no, look, the ancient tomb is afire. I'm sure you're heartbroken about that, Indy. Oh, look, Indy, there, there's a knight from ancient times and he's still alive. Boy, I, I bet a history and archaeology loving preserving of culture such as yourself will have a lot of things you want to ask him. Hey, hey where are you going? The, the temple, there, there's a temple right there. The temple is, is immeasurably important for history. Historians will love studying that. There's like like proof of God's existence and, and the secret of eternal life. Oh well, you know, temple collapsed, we lost it, oh well, bye-bye. Wait, isn't that to state how archaeologists always find their ancient cities? That's what you usually do, right? A bunch of rocks buried in the sand? I'm sure there's, there's a museum who'd love to exhibit parts of this amazing historical phenomenon, right, Indy? Now, don't get me wrong, I'm being a bit silly here. If Indy would spend the ending of the movie running back to the ruins and try to preserve it, he'd look like a pathetic nerd. It would interfere with the emotional flow of the scene, and worse, it would have gone against the movie's highly intelligent the treasure is bad okay? message, and we can't have that. Even if his interest in the treasure is purely from an academic perspective, movies like this require the hero to flip the bird to the treasure and its cultural context in the end. And this is a caveman movie. It's about bad guys being punched and epic buoy traps to be circumvented. It's not really about any intellectual point, which is exactly why I find it funny these movies always try to have a smart point. <laughs> but hey, at least Indy's still motivated. He's still energized. At least he still functions as a proper action hero. But then we go to the fourth movie, and there it doesn't even bother with the it belongs in the museum stuff anymore. Now Indy's a completely empty shell. Look, we found proof that aliens exist. Whatever, I want to go home. We found the tomb of the legendary and still preserved Francisco de Orellana. Whatever, I want to go home. In the first movie, villains pointed guns at Indy all the time to prevent him to go to the treasure. In the fourth movie, the villains constantly need to shove machine guns in his face just to get him to the treasure. Man, the cover of that movie should have just been Spalco dragged Indy along with his hair. But I don't want to go on an adventure. I mean, I, I guess I can't blame him since every damn movie, comic, video game, and novel he's been in ends with a treasure trying to murder him, so I guess I wouldn't give a damn about stupid treasure either anymore. Fine, Hitler. Take the chalice of the fountain of you from Atlantis. You'll probably start shooting lasers until your face explodes anyway. So, there's some moral of these stories. Respect history. Don't just go claw for the treasure out of greed. Have respect for culture. India respects culture. Look how carefully he smashes through those ancient structures and making sure they're all preserved in pristine condition. Don't do it for greed, but do it for wisdom. Like movie 4 of villain Spalco did and then gets killed for it. So I guess doing it for intellectual enlightenment is also bad, huh? So uh, the moral of treasure hunting movies is, uh, whatever, I want to go home. Tip. I love how after Spalco asks for wisdom, the aliens just pump her so full of wisdom she explodes. Why? So if she was thirsty and would ask for a glass of water, would the aliens just drop an entire ocean on her? Stupid aliens. Anyway, so yet again, here we have an entire movie genre that hates itself. It lures you in with the, the promise of an awesome treasure, and then it slaps you across the face for daring to enjoy such treasure. Ha! <laughs> I love it! It's great! More movie genres should be like this. That'd be awesome! <laughs> Imagine a romantic movie. The girl's all, I need to find my true love. And then she's at the, the wedding altar. And the priest is all, do you choose this man as your loving husband? And the girls are like, yes. And the priest goes, you've chosen poorly. <laughs> and the lasers come out of everyone and everyone's face is melting and, and her face explodes and everyone dies. Yeah, uh, love is bad, McKay. 
So there's this movie. Uh, my wife's gonna hate me for mocking this one. Uh, but there's this, this anime movie, The Boy and the Beast. It's great. So there's a kid in the real world of Japan. And his dad sucks, school sucks, everything sucks. So he's angry. And then there's a random beast man. And the kid follows the beast man. And he walks into a magic fairy tale world. And it's all sunny. And everyone's like a cool hand throw. And there's a fighting tournament. And a king. And whoever wins the tournament becomes master of the beast or something. And his legendary warrior starts training the kid. And they're all training and having adventures. And he's going on his kung fu quest looking for the kung fu masters and they're giving him advice and it's all a big adventure and then we're halfway through the movie and the kids is like yeah fuck it and then he goes back to the real world and, and he wants to go back to school so he, he goes to the school to enroll so he uh, fil fills in some papers but he can't enroll because he needs to do an entry exam first and he also needs a passport to ask for the entrance exam so he has to go to the government and fill in some government papers so then he goes to the library to study for the entrance exam but he needs to fill in some papers to get permission from the library so he fills in some government papers and then he reconnects his dad so he needs to fill in some government papers until he meets a girl and then needs to fill in some government papers so he can meet up this girl but then he has to fill in some government papers and hey movie what is this I want Kung Fu animals, damn it! What is this? But my inner Mr. Spock is all like, no, 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 no. This is all very sensible, a very good story. He's no longer running away from the real world. He's finally taking responsibility and no longer hiding in his make-believe world of his youth. By cleaning up his room and mending his relationship with his dad, he's finally becoming a real adult and- Great, who wrote this movie? Jordan Peterson? Go back and turn people into zombie Nazi robots from space or whatever the newspapers say you're doing. I'm trying to watch that Kung Fu action movie, damn it! Anyway, so the, the kid's girlfriend is in trouble. She's bullied by some bullies, because that's what bullies do. And then the Kung Fu kid comes out. And he brandishes a weapon. Yes! Finally! Kung Fu again! So he's about to fight, and then the, the whole fight takes place off screen. And, and then his girlfriend starts berating him. Uh, yeah, Kung Fu is a uh, bad McCain. Okay? And uh, don't use violence, McCain. Okay? Uh, just fill in some uh, gov government forms, okay? Yeah, okay, fine. Sure, drop it! Fuck the Kung Fu plotline. Let him enroll in school and then become a salary man and... And get married and have a crying kid and a nagging wife and has to clean up his apartment and work extra hours at work and then die of a heart attack at 40. The end. Awesome. Perfect ending. Yes. And then as the pre credit sequence, you go back to the animal world and all the animals are dead because the main character of their kung fu adventure walked out of them so nobody could stop the villain. Awesome. But alas, unfortunately the movie doesn't go that direction. The movie actually does go back to the animal world, reluctantly, almost spiteful. Immediately killing the person the kung fu kid returned for and making the kid swear he'll never return there. Because sure, fine, you can have your stupid kung fu climax, but ooh, we're gonna burn all the bridges and leave the middle finger extended. You know, it's it's great. It's amazing. I, I absolutely love it. it. It's very smart. It's very artful. It's, it's very intelligent. And I think every single movie should do exactly this. That would be amazing. Ooh, ooh when a new James Bond movie comes out. I, I want the first half of the movie to be like straightforward James Bond, fighting, chases, cars, women. But then in the halfway point, he runs into his mom. Jimmy! For three weeks! But mom, I was in Peru stopping Blofeld's death ray! Oh, you're still playing with those terrorists, Jimmy! They're bad company! Why don't you settle down with a nice girl? Mom, I did settle down with Tracy, and then she got shot, and I settled down with Vesper, and she drowned. Oh, they're all hussies, Jimmy! Nothing but trouble! Barbara across the street! Her daughter will knock that spirit out of you! To make a hottest man out of you, Jimmy! Force you to get a real job! Mom, Secret Service is a real job! Ah, oh, that'd be great. Or the next Fast and Furious movie. It's all about family. Dom, it's your mom. Oh, God damn it, not that family! Toby, when are you gonna settle down and get a real job? Mom! The mask! As a kid, I hated the ending. You can turn into the most awesomest dude in the universe and then you throw the mask away? You moron, Jim Carrey! No, well, the mask got him into legal trouble. Also, in the comic, you shut up, Mr. Spock! This is what I like to call boomerang movies. It's like, so your real world is boring, mundane, a drag, you want to escape. What's a movie for escapism, right? So here's a movie about a dinosaur's kung fu treasure. Hey, you escaped your boring mundane life. And then halfway through the movie, prison warden Jeff Goldblum comes in and is all like, Uh, dinosaurs adventure in kung fu are bad, okay? And kicks you right back to the real world. Bam! End credits. <laughs> You're just another brick in a wall. Back into the machine, you soulless gear. Whammo! You're an adult. Stop having fun, damn it. Awesome. Back where we started. Now, as much as I'm mocking the morals of these movies, again, it's not like they're fundamentally bad. There are sensible morals to learn. My inner Mr. Spock approves. Yes, of course, in the real world, I don't think we should be kung fu fighting our problems away. At least I think I do. It does sound kind of cool. <laughs>
It's just hilarious to me how much of those morals are conflicting and go against the entire nature of the core movie, the very premise they're luring you into. Lots of anime movies love deconstructing that too. Like Steam Boy, that movie. It's like the first 20 minutes of the movie is my favorite movie of all time. And then the other two hours of that movie is just them slapping me across the face for daring me to enjoy those first 20 minutes. It's amazing. So, I propose a toast to Boomerang movies. Movies that lure you in with a premise of escapism just to viciously punch you back to reality. Movies that act like a commercial for McDonald's and then turn to lecture you on a healthy diet right when you're starting to enjoy yourself. It's a wonderful thing. So, to celebrate, grab a cup of your favorite beverage, raise it, bring it to your lips, and... Drinks are bad, McKay? Okay? And put the glass back down, you immoral bastard. Mr. Spock is disappointed at you. You were drinking something sweet, weren't you? Or with caffeine or alcohol in it or something, huh? Only water is sensible, or milk, maybe. Drinks are bad, McKay. Okay?